In December 2025, the SkyTrain marks its 40th anniversary, four decades since a bold experiment in automated rapid transit that changed how the region moves. When it first opened in 1985, few could have predicted how profoundly it would shape the city. What began as a showcase project for Expo 86 had grown into one of the longest fully automated transit systems in the world. It helped define Metro Vancouver's modern identity, linking downtown to emerging urban centers and guiding how communities developed around its stations. The SkyTrain story stretches far beyond its opening day. It's the culmination of a century of transit evolution, from the electric streetcars of the British Columbia Electric Railway, to failed monorail dreams, to the technological leap that finally brought rapid transit to the region. Transit operations were an early cornerstone of Greater Vancouver and the Lower Mainland since the late 19th century. For more than 60 years, the British Columbia Electric Railway moved people and goods throughout the region, connecting communities with a vast network of streetcars and interurbans. But by the 1940s, the rise of personal vehicle ownership began to reshape transportation priorities. As car traffic grew, the BCER's electric lines lost their appeal. Routes were gradually shut down, and by February 28, 1958, the last interurban, running between Marple and Steveston, made its final trip. In the years that followed, Vancouver entered the rails-to-rubber era. Buses took over public transit, offering greater flexibility to navigate increasingly congested roads, yet the idea of a modern rapid transit system never fully disappeared. Two separate proposals soon emerged for a monorail linking downtown Vancouver to the airport. In the mid-50s, Vancouver Airport Manager Bill Inglis proposed a growth strategy that would reserve the airport for long-haul flights. Service to cities in BC such as Victoria, Powell River, and Kelowna would be by helicopter from a downtown heliport to be built at the east end of False Creek. Connecting the two would be a monorail. It would cover the 15 kilometers or so in 10 minutes and would include possible freight and mail service. BC Electric Vice President W.C. Mainwaring had recently returned from Europe where he'd been impressed by a German monorail system. He prepared a report recommending that BC Electric invest in the concept. Canadian engineer Wells Coates, newly returned from London, was brought in to design it. His proposal, the Monospan Twin Ride System, envisioned small side-mounted cabins gliding along a single elevated rail. But when BC Electric withdrew financial backing and limited its role to providing rights-of-way, the project fell apart. About 14 years after the first proposal, American engineer Anson S. Bilger revived the idea of a monorail from Waterfront Station to the airport. His 1960s plan followed West Boulevard and Arbuta Street, with four stops, a 15-minute trip time, and a $35 million price tag. Freight and mail services were again included to boost revenue. Because the CPR's Arbutus rail line was still active, the monorail would have needed tall support towers, and Bilger offered CPR a fee of one cent per passenger for air rights. Like the previous monorail plan, it never left the drawing board. In 1970, the Greater Vancouver Area Rapid Transit Study was released. It evaluated options for a high-capacity transit system to relieve growing congestion and support regional growth. Commissioned amid freeway debates, it analyzed projected travel demand, compared modes, and recommended a grade-separated transit corridor linking downtown with suburban centers along existing rail and arterial routes. Not everyone liked the idea. Dr. Julius Kane of UBC argued that the fixed nature of the proposal lacked the versatility that could be achieved with a rapid bus network. Suggesting that uh, a concrete octopus be superimposed in the city of Vancouver with the head arms being located at Georgia and Granville and then the tentacles radiating out from there. It's going to be a financial and uh, social disaster for the city of Vancouver if it's implemented the way it's uh, structured as of the uh, present moment. Despite Dr. Kane's criticism, Planners in the early 70s shifted fully toward rapid transit as the future of urban transportation. The recent public backlash that ended Vancouver's downtown freeway plans pushed the city firmly in that direction. This shift required cooperation from all municipalities. 
the Greater Vancouver Regional District, which had previously focused on water, sewer, and waste management, expanded its mandate to include regional planning. In 1975, it introduced the Livable Region Plan, the first major effort to guide growth after the freeway era. The plan aimed to control sprawl, protect farmland and green space, and concentrate new development along transit corridors instead of highways. The GVRD released a study in 1979 exploring several transportation models, light rail, busways, and intermediate capacity transit system, or ICTS, then an experimental technology created by the Urban Transportation Development Corporation, formed by the Ontario government, which featured driverless trains powered by linear induction motors. The GVRD initially backed light rail. It was practical, scalable, proven, and cheaper to operate than the ICTS system. The BC government favored ICTS, and in 1979 created the Urban Transit Authority, a new crown corporation responsible for planning and funding public transit. This move sidelined the GVRD and placed final authority for rapid transit decisions under provincial control. That same year, the province submitted a bid to host a transportation-themed fair called Transpo 86, tied to Vancouver's upcoming centennial. In 1980, it was granted World Exposition status and rebranded as Expo 86. With the new fair now on the horizon, the province pushed to highlight Canada's experimental ICTS technology and its linear induction propulsion system as part of the showcase. A linear induction motor moves trains using magnetic force rather than spinning parts. Each car draws electricity from a third rail along the side of the guideway. Beneath the car, a power unit generates a moving magnetic wave that travels down its length. As that wave passes over an aluminum plate between the rails, it induces electric currents in the metal. Those currents push back against the train's magnetic field, creating the force that propels it forward. The route for the rapid transit line would begin in New Westminster, following the old BCER right-of-way through Burnaby on a new elevated guideway. At Broadway and Commercial, it broke from the BCER route heading west, then down the median of Terminal Ave toward Main Street, curving around False Creek to reach the newly built BC Place. From there, the line would continue underground into the downtown core. To save both time and money, engineers decided to reuse an existing Canadian Pacific Railway tunnel that had run beneath downtown since 1933. The Dunsmere Tunnel had originally been built to take freight trains off of city streets. In the early part of the century, trains moving between the Burrard Inlet and False Creek Yards regularly blocked several major downtown crossings for up to 20 minutes at a time. That changed on July 16, 1933, when all CPR trains were redirected through the new tunnel. For the first time, vehicles, streetcars, and buses could move freely through the city center. By the early 1980s, the tunnel had fallen silent. Freight operations had shifted away from False Creek, leaving the Dunsmere Tunnel dormant until planners recognized it as the perfect route for the city's new rapid transit system into the downtown core. The Dunsmere Tunnel underwent major modifications to accommodate the new system. Engineers found the tunnel was too narrow to fit two tracks side by side, but its original height of 8.8 .8 meters provided enough space to stack them instead. This design placed the westbound trains on an upper deck and the eastbound trains below, separated by a new concrete divider running through the middle of the tunnel. The conversion made efficient use of the existing infrastructure while keeping excavation to a minimum. Construction of the line was in full swing in the early 80s. It was referred to as the Advanced Light Rail Transit, or ALRT for short. In the summer of 1983, the first one-kilometer section of the ALRT system was ready for public testing. Riders were invited to board at Main Street Station and travel east along Terminal Ave before looping back. The trial ran for six months, and more than 300,000 people had the chance to experience this new driverless technology. During this time, the province merged the Urban Transit Authority and Metro Transit Operating Company into a single crown corporation, BC Transit. The new agency took over both the planning and the operation of transit across British Columbia. Construction on the full line continued through the next two years, and by the fall of 1985, the system was undergoing final testing. Then, in November 1985, Grace McCarthy, the minister responsible for rapid transit, unveiled its official name. Goodbye ALRT, hello SkyTrain. 
The SkyTrain was officially inaugurated on December 11, 1985 by Premier Bill Bennett. The following day it opened to the public with free trial rides offered several days a week until January 3, 1986, when regular paid service began. It was fully operational five months before Expo 86 and entered the World's Fair already established as a functioning rapid transit system. The SkyTrain became the backbone of transit in Metro Vancouver. Its growth and the region's land use strategy worked hand in hand to reshape how people live, work, and move. Its early success prompted immediate expansion. Construction soon began on the Sky Bridge, a cable-stayed transit-only bridge that was the longest of its kind in the world at the time. It carried the SkyTrain from New Westminster across the Fraser River to Scott Road Station in Surrey. Further extensions added three more stations, with the line reaching King George Station in 1994. In 1999, the provincial government again restructured regional transportation in the Lower Mainland. TransLink officially took over all transit responsibilities for Metro Vancouver, including SkyTrain, buses, the major road network, as well as Patello and Golden Ears Bridge. Going forward, long-term planning and funding decisions were managed at the regional level, rather than by the province. Expansion continued with the opening of the Millennium Line in 2002, which brought service through East Vancouver, North Burnaby and Coquitlam before reconnecting to the original route in New Westminster. With two lines now in operation, the original SkyTrain line was renamed the Expo Line in honour of the World's Fair. In 2009, the Canada Line was completed, linking Waterfront Station to Richmond and Vancouver Airport just in time for the 2010 Winter Olympics. This line was built entirely underground through Vancouver, surfacing only before crossing the north arm of the Fraser River into Richmond. Unlike the rest of the SkyTrain network, the Canada Line does not use a linear induction motor system. Instead, it operates with conventional electric propulsion while still maintaining fully automated driverless service. In 2016, the Evergreen Extension opened, pushing the Millennium Line from Lougheed Town Centre through Port Moody into Coquitlam. Ongoing work includes the Millennium Line Extension along the Broadway Corridor to Arbutus, scheduled for completion in late 2027. At the same time, the Expo Line is being pushed east from King George Station along Fraser Highway to Langley City Centre. Future expansion also includes a proposed Millennium Line extension from Arbutus to UBC. This project would replace the 99B Line, which was the busiest bus route in North America before the pandemic, carrying roughly 55,900 passengers per weekday. A short spur was built near Coquitlam Central Station to preserve the option of one day extending service toward Port Coquitlam. The Pitt River Bridge was also designed to accommodate future rapid transit, leaving the door open for a possible expansion towards Pitt Meadows and Maple Ridge, though no formal plans exist today. With the success of the system, SkyTrain has become the standard for rapid transit in Metro Vancouver. Every extension reshapes how people travel and how neighborhoods develop, and communities across the region want the connectivity it provides. Looking back at the original 1970 concept drawing, it's striking how closely today's network reflects the vision laid out more than half a century ago. The details changed and the technology evolved, but the core idea stayed intact. SkyTrain didn't just meet that vision, it exceeded it. Mm -hmm.